Amen. Amen. As we pray, Lord, have your way in me. Sometimes God puts on our hearts some new way of serving the Lord. And, um, and I've been excited to hear about how folks are being led to, to worship the Lord here and to serve the Lord both within the church and outside of the church. And it's just really, really exciting. And so thanks to those of you that responded last week to Becky McHale's invitation to, uh, to write down, you know, hey, I'd be willing to help with this or that. Um, there are little spreadsheets on your table there that if you miss that, um, that you can jump in. And there are uh, some folks even starting today uh, helping behind the scenes to help this service to happen. And that's just really, really exciting. I really appreciate it. And, um, and so there again, you know, if you missed that, there are little sheets on your table there. There is another sheet as well, looks very similar. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So each Sunday for this season of the fall, I want to keep um, talking about and celebrating and praying for God's anointing upon people that are serving through our church here in different ways, help you to get to know them, help you to maybe think about, hey, is this something that, that God might want me to do? And so today we're going to talk a little bit about groups, uh, life groups, small groups, those types of things. And, um, and in just a second, I'm going to invite Steve Payne up here because he leads a life group. Um, he's uh, helped to substitute for a group. Uh, we're going to talk about some things that we're going to be doing in terms of with, with life groups. And this is just one Sunday of many that we'll be talking about that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but when you think about a group, um, I've noticed in the scripture and then in, in life as we live it right now, that there is a uh, kind of an interesting strategy that Jesus employed. Um, I use the acrostic same because it's the same Lord, it's the same Holy Spirit, but it's different for different folks in different times, okay? So same Lord, same Holy Spirit, same kind of strategy. And that is S-A-M-E, small, small conversation kind of groups, small groups of people where you can be heard and be known. You know, you may not know everybody that comes and worships here or in some other church or something, but you can get to know a few people. Um, how many of you sit at roughly the same set of table folks each, each Sunday? You know? Not everybody, but probably looks like about half of the folks, you know, this is kind of roughly where we sit, and you kind of get to know folks and stuff, and that's beautiful. And if you're new here today, one of the things we don't want you to ever feel is like you sat in somebody else's seat. Like, that's, that's no big deal. We love you. Don't ever freak out about that, okay? And uh, one of the unusual things about this service is um, when you come and sit at a restaurant, you don't normally go and sit at somebody else's table, but here that's fine, right? <laughs> you know, you can kind of join in and that kind of thing. It's really, really cool, but it is different. Why do we do that? Well, part of it is um, so that you can have a little smaller environment. Instead of trying to learn 100 people's names, maybe you can get to know a few people, you know, kind of sitting around your table in the, there. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a beautiful thing. Um, accountable. Um, Jesus had disciples that he held accountable in kind of that relational way. Very small group. You get to know each other, and then you get to say, hey, how are you doing? And I care. I want you to say something more than just fine, right? But if you pass a stranger, you know, you just kind of like, fine, that's good, but, but accountable and um, helping each other to be Christ-like. Multiplying, that's a kicker, right? Because sometimes we can just get insulated and say, okay, we're doing well, but what if we have something that we'd like to share with other people? What if, what if that kind of group really helps us? And that's something you're going to hear about from Steve here today. If it's helpful, then let's multiply it. Let's help other people to have that experience as well. And then it's empowering, you know, God's power. Uh, who doesn't need more power to live strong and wise and loving, right? I mean, we're all looking for that. And one of the ways that we get that is when we get to interact with people in small, kind of accountable, multiplying groups of some sort, some way, somehow. So we have life groups here where you get to share life together. And, uh, and then we have studies, Bible studies, and, and all kinds of other different types of groups. Steve, are you out there? Here, I'm talking about you. Come on up, brother. Once in a while you hear his voice in the back, you know, Nathan's wrong. No, that's not usually what he says. But if he does, you might know, listen to him. That'd be good. So, uh, Steve, I'll let you uh, come on up here. It's a little, little crazy way up here, um, but uh, we'll make sure people can see you. And uh, everybody say hi, Steve. Hi. I'll sit down and listen to you, all right? Okay. Tell us about small groups, life groups, what you do. Yeah. Um... So I've been leading the Wednesday night 
life group for multiple years. I've lost track of how many now. We've had a lot of different faces come in and out. Um, Cheryl Hayes, Jeff Festog, my wife, um, are some of the people that are in there. The Kualus come. Um, so I actually wrote something down <laughs> for this, and if you're a part of Wednesday night, that shouldn't surprise you, because on every week we, we work out of a packet that I write, and it can be sometimes five pages long, but it's more like a guide of what we're going to be looking at. Um, and what's really impressed me about this group is the desire that people have for God's word, which is really what I'm good at, I guess, is talking about God's word. So some years ago, we did a church-wide study called Christmas is Not Your Birthday. Does everybody remember that? Yeah? It had a big impact on me. And it wasn't so much for the, the idea that, you know, don't spend money on your kids at Christmas because they don't deserve anything. It's not their birthday, even though that would save us a lot of money because we have five, right? <laughs> um, it more had to do with the idea that if you have a perverted view of God, you're going to have a perverted view of your relationship with God. How you view God directly impacts your life. And that is a testament to the entire world that we see today. Why are there so many different sects of Christianity? Why are there so many different religions? It's because of our view of God. Um, how we understand the cross will have a direct impact on how we interact with the people around us. I think that's true too. If we, if we understand the cross to be just personally about us and that's it, then it's not gonna affect how I relate with you. But if I understand it to impact your life as well, it's directly gonna uh, affect how I interact with you. The book of Hosea records God as saying that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And if you are familiar with that story, you know it's a different context, but I think it's true. I think everyone in this room at some point in your life has thought, God, why? Or you've been reading in the scriptures and you thought, this doesn't make any sense. Again, how we view God directly impacts our faith, how we live our life. How we view the cross directly impacts how we interact with each other. And Wednesday night, I've tried to create, I've tried to let it be a place where you can come, and yeah, we're going to have a section of scripture already planned out that we're going to look at, and I'm going to have a study guide that helps us walk us through that. But it's also a place where you can say, well, what's the point of that? If God's so good, how can you explain this? Right? I mean, our, our understanding is God is love, and yet some of the things we read in Scripture can tempt us to think that God is not love. And those are serious things that we have to address as people. Because people that aren't identifying as God's people are asking those questions, and they have answers. And hopefully, on Wednesday night, that's what we can do. It's a safe place to come together. You can bear your soul with us. And we'll accept it. I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. You know, when a man came to Jesus and said, uh, you know, heal my son if you can. And Jesus said, if I can, all you have to do is believe. And he said, you know, help my unbelief. I don't believe, but I want to. And Jesus healed him. He healed his son. He's not afraid of our doubts. And he's not afraid of our moments of unbelief. And he's not afraid of our questions and our troubles and the things that make us rage. He's not afraid of that. He welcomes it. And he's our advocate. And I think for too long, we have felt like we're ashamed of that. And shame and guilt, condemnation, and who the sun sets free is free indeed. So do we understand that? Are we able to walk through our life confidently? When bad things come against us and the enemy who is out to get us comes against us, are we able to stand up against them? Do we know who we are as a people? Um, I went really off track, which is something else that sometimes we do. So the book of Hosea records that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, and Proverbs 4 gives us a beautiful 
instruction and warning that in all of your getting and everything that you, you do in your life, get wisdom, get understanding. Because we're destroyed with, without it. How we understand God directly affects our life and how we live it. Um, so Wednesday night, Life Group is a Bible study that focuses on Scripture and on each other. There are nights when we take the guide and we kind of toss it aside and we pull it out next week. And we'll talk about you and what you're going through. And we'll love on you and help you. They've, my group has helped me. I've gone through some crazy stuff in the last few years of leading this group. And whether they knew it or not, they really spoke to my life. They helped me endure and, and move forward with things. You know, Sunday morning is a great time to see faces to hear the word of God from Nathan. And he does a great job. I'm very critical. I'll admit that. But he's a, he's a great man of God. He knows what he's saying. He has a heart for Christ and he has a passion to reach people. And that's what we get to hear every week. That's what I hear. But life groups is about, like Nathan said, interacting with people. It's like a, sitting at one of these tables where you actually get to interact on a larger scale. And we need that. We need that community because if you feel like you don't fit in within the church context, you never will on a Sunday. It's just, it's not built around that kind of interaction. So when we, when we come together on Sunday morning, we're coming together as a family. But we should be getting together through the week as well. We need to, we need to know who's out there for our benefit. Who can we lean on? Who can you call in the middle of the night or the middle of the day? I like to think you could call me. If you don't have my number, I'll give it to you. And I mean that. So Wednesday night life group is about focusing on scripture. Who are you in relation to God? And who are you in relation to me? Who are we in relation to each other? That's what we're about. Um, Sunday after first service, I've been also taking over this Sunday school class, which really is about what we talk about in here. So it's different than Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're going through the book of Genesis. This Wednesday, we're going to start with chapter 12. We've gone through Adam to Babel and the genealogies and everything else in between. And we're starting with Abraham. So if you want to come out, come out. We're always open. It's always a good time to drop in. You know, come in and we'll, we'll help you out. Sunday morning, it's this with questions. So if you hear Nathan say something, you're like, I didn't understand that. Can we talk about that? Yeah, we can talk about it. And all you're, under, and all you're getting, get understanding. That's what I'm about. So It's awesome, Steve. And so behind Steve, you, you may say, what, what's this about? Well, Life groups, if you have kids, sometimes it can be tricky, you know. Um, so right after this service, there is Bible Zone 10.3, which is a little different than the 9 o'clock Bible Zone, but yet it's still um, Christian-based, Christian principle, teaching the Bible to kids. So if you wanted to be a part of a life group right after this worship service, there's built-in child care. That's one of the things we wanted to make sure that you knew about as well. So we're kind of rebooting that, that life group after this service, and it may grow into two or three life groups. I mean, if you had different emphases, if, uh, if you wanted a, t a group to be just men or just women or have a, a different type of topic, um, something like that, we can talk about that. So you may say, well, gosh, I'd love more information, or wow, um, I've got a beard also, so I could lead a life group, or uh, that's what it's something his shirt says up there, right? So, um, or, or maybe, maybe you're just like, you know what, um, this sounds great. I couldn't do Wednesday nights or Sundays uh, mornings, but I'd love to be a part of something and maybe even help start a new one. We need to keep starting new ones. So guess what? You, on, your, on your tables, you also have a little spreadsheet that says, you know, if you wanted to say, hey, um, I'm interested in that life group after this worship service. That would fit my time and my lifestyle to give another hour to just kind of interact with people, ask questions, pray for people, and that kind of stuff. You can write that down. Or if you're like, ah, I'd like to help start another one, you can do that. 
And the final thing that I wanted to do is to pray for life group leaders that are already leading life groups. So like Adrian, if you don't mind, just kind of coming right up here, and we're going to have Steve up here, and we have other life group leaders out there. Would you just kind of come down here, and, and you can even kind of stand here with, uh, with Adrian, you know, and, and we're going to pray for you that God would anoint you and help you. Yeah, that's fine, Steve. Mic drop. Poof, right now, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. All right. So you don't, you know. And, and I've, I lead one at, at 1.30 on Wednesday, so it's kind of in the middle of the day. So if you're a third shift worker or something, you can sleep and then come over. Or if you're retired or not working right now, whatever, you can be a part of that. We'll, we'll talk about how to get involved in other ones a little later, you know, and have the smorgasbord of, of ones that you could join up with. But uh, this is a pretty good group of folks, right? All look a little different, all different backgrounds, all different, you know, kind of, you know, ways of going about things. So there's no, like, one cookie cutter. You don't just have to be, you know, some particular person. Is that cool? All right, so let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, each person that is up here, um, they have been brave because they have felt your call to help to gather people together and to focus on you and to talk about your scripture in the Bible in some way, shape, or form and to engage other resources and other topics that that are true to our life where you are, are trying to help us to live your way. So I pray for your anointing to be upon each one of these brothers and sisters of mine, your daughters, your sons, that are simply trying to put themselves out there to gather people together and help them to support each other and pray and seek your face all together. So lift them up, protect them from evil, give them insight beyond what they could ever think on their own. Help them to keep going even when the going gets rough or tough or difficult. And when they want to give up, then carry them and encourage them anew. Thank you, Lord. Anoint them with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, would you thank them for their bravery as well? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. We're going to talk about a little bit more of the Bible here, and uh, we're going to talk about um, expectations. We've been, been talking about that a lot over the past few weeks, right, um, and, uh, and how our expectations affect our joy and how we live our life. If we have expectations that are too high, then um, we may be always dissatisfied and upset <laughs> if we have expectations that are too low, we may not be doing all that God wants us to do. But if our expectations are just where God wants them to be, we can have the most amount of joy. We can be living into life just the right way. It's absolutely powerful. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. As I talk, not all of us have the same things that, um, that we hear. Uh, guys in the sound booth, would you mind, it, you may have already, and if you have, don't worry about it, but can you mute all the other channels? There are a couple of things that I can hear that, uh, that are kind of, kind of um, maybe distracting to some of you guys. I don't want that to happen. Ooh. Oh, ho, ho. Test one, two. Okay, I wasn't the only one. Hey, God, th man, thank you. Thanks, Frank, up there. Mm -hmm. We talked about the sound crew last week, didn't we? Are you happy for their sound crew? <laughs> Pretty awesome. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, awesome. All right. So I was talking with a friend who's here today. And uh, he said, you know, we, there is like in our culture a general skepticism toward organizations, big institutions. There's a skepticism. There's even a cynicism. We don't trust them. And as I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, that'd be a good thing for us to talk about then, right? I mean, that would be a really good topic for us to talk about. What are our expectations of organizations, of people? You might call them institutions, you might call them organizations, doesn't matter, some big collections of people, some of which are listed on your bulletin. Things like the government, schools, clubs, you know, anything where you've got a group, even big stores, you know, what do we expect from those types of big organizations? And as I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, we, um, we've all been influenced by a, a cynical mindset, as have I. And sometimes it's even kind of funny to even think that way. George Carlin, you may have heard of, right? Not a preacher, <laughs> but had prophetic words to say, right? And, and he was very critical of big institutions, right? I mean, he would talk about, there are people that run our country, and they don't care about you, 
and they're out for the almighty dollar, and they're going to use you. They just want slaves that are just going to work menial jobs with low pay and no benefits, but they don't care about you, and no one seems to care. Right? Have some of you heard him say that? I mean, yeah. Now, I'm not recommending you go home and Google him, right? You know, I I censored out a few words that he uses when he talks about that. Um, But at the same time, I get what he's talking about, and there's a certain extent to which I agree with what he's talking about. Because we've seen things happen that have made us really, really mad at the government. I mean, how many of us, we talk about this once in a while, I bring this up once in a while because this is important. How many of us are really excited for our kids to go into politics? And we're like, yeah, run for Congress. It's going to be so great. It's going to be, you know, you know, or just thinking about, are we happy with the institutions around us? How many of us would say, the IRS is swell, you know, two thumbs up, you know. Oh, the Medicare, the Social Security Administration, they're so amazing. This is great, you know. Um, And even about churches, churches. I mean, through the past 20 years, there have been scandals and, and just, you know, crazy things behind the scenes. And then people are like, man, I don't know if I can trust them, you know. And I get it. I get it. And then I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know, organizations, institutions, they have a history of doing some really, really good things and some really, really bad things. And so because they've done some really good things and some really bad things, it makes sense for us to have a certain level of skepticism and concern. But you know who else has a history of doing some really, really good things and some really, really bad things? You and me. (laughs) Like on an individual level. I mean... If I started thinking about this, have I ever lied? Have you ever lied? Ever? Like, no. Well, yeah, we probably have, right? How many of us have said something that wasn't quite true? You know, how many of us have have not finished something that we said we were going to do? How many of us promised ourselves, when I get to be that age, then I'll never do blah, 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 blah. And then you got to that age, and you're like, ah, darn it. (laughs) Or I haven't done that which I thought that I would do. I haven't lived into that promise I made to myself. You know, we start putting this on an individual level and we start realizing, well, wait a second. Is it really fair to expect from an organization or a big institution something that we even we ourselves for ourselves have not been able to live out? Does it make any sense for me to place my hope and trust in the government to fix all of my problems when I struggle to fix my problems and I know myself way better than the government does? Does that make sense? But if you start looking on Facebook, how many times do you see people being thankful for the big institutions of our world? (laughs) Like, almost never, right? It's like, criticism, criticism, this is horrible, this is horrible. I, I had a friend, true story, I had a friend say something a bit critical about the government and Trump, and one of her friends on Facebook suggested she get an MRI because her brain must be messed up. I mean, holy smokes, right? Uh, I mean, this is crazy. And people can't comment on your stuff typically like that unless they're your friend, right? With friends like those who needs enemies, you know? I mean, it's like, holy smokes. But yet we get the idea. You know, you show up at, in a McDonald's early, early in the morning or some other breakfast institution, and you hear the, the, the guys kind of getting around talking a, about, you know, politics or about, you know, what's going on in life. And, man, you know, it's like, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is crazy. And I get it, right? I mean, you get, you get the, the group of ladies together, you know, uh, you know maybe you've got you know, the, kind of the play date, and the ladies are, you know, kind of here, and they're talking and stuff, and, and sometimes, the, sometimes it can go a little negative toward this or that, you know, kind of institution or that company, or, man, they're, you know, they said this, and then they're doing that. I mean, it gets crazy. And I started just kind of thinking about, okay, God, what, what's like a reasonable way to think about institutions and organizations and what we should expect of them because when we have really high expectations of them they don't live into it why because they're groups of individuals and individuals are broken I mean, we're, we're broken people there's a, a part of the bible you know this would, this would make an interesting tattoo no one is righteous no not one that's romans chapter 3 verse 10 now that's true but that doesn't mean that that should be our goal Well, I can live into that all day long, man, no problem. But God has a different level of expectation for us individually. And God even has a different expectation of the organizations. So this message is not meant to say, 
okay, let's just have low expectations for organizations and individuals and just be happy that we all stink, right? Yeah, we all stink. No, that's not what we're talking about. However, however, we do have to realize that when bad people do bad things or organizations that, are, that have a lot of bad people in them do bad things, there is a certain element of we shouldn't be surprised. And we, we ought to say, hey, you know, we're broken people. We're all struggling with sin and our own brokenness. And sometimes it gets the better of us. So let's not let it steal our joy that there are things that aren't working right or that don't go right. Let's guard our hearts from that and say, hey, let's try to set our, our goals a little higher maybe, but at the same time understand that when things go wrong or people let us down or the government doesn't do what we think they ought to do or this institution doesn't do what we think they ought to do or my company doesn't do what I think it should do, let's realize that there are groups of individuals and those individuals have problems and they have brokenness and we've got to kind of ask God to help us to understand how do we go forward. Now, how an organization should go forward go forward. Well, the Bible has some very specific requirements for governments. Here's one of them. Romans chapter 13, verse 4. In that same book that declares that we're all struggling with sin and we're all broken, that same book says, well, God's expectations for us, though, are higher than just, well, just keep sinning. No, God's going to help us to do better. Part of the better is to care about people. It says, one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are whose servants? God's servants. When you're in a leadership position, this leans toward the government, but it's not just the government. When you're in a leadership position, you're to be God's servant. You're, you're enslaved to God's righteousness, goodness, and love. You're God's servant. Agents of wrath, that's where it leans into the government side and police and, and soldiers and so forth, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So in a government, when it works right, the expectation is it's going to enact justice for all people. Now, that's only going to happen if all the individuals in the government work toward that end, right? So in the book of Proverbs, some of the Proverbs are written from a king to the king's son. A king's son is called a what? A prince. Eventually a prince is going to become a what? A king. Exactly. So you're seeing some major high level advice for leaders. And in this case, <laughs> this sounds very similar to the book of Romans as well. Proverbs 31 9, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the rich and the powerful that are putting you into office. No, that's not what it says, is it? No, no, no. This is from a rich king to a rich prince who says, you know what? Remember the rights of the poor and the needy. Who gives the rights? It's not the people, it's God. Throughout the whole book of Proverbs, right? It's an orientation where God says, these people deserve to be cared for. You and power care for them. So it's not that we should have low expectations all the time for the government or whoever's in leadership. We should say, no, those expectations are high, but they are realistic in that we know that the people to whom these charges are given are still imperfect, they're struggling, they're trying to be forgiven by God and led by God. And so that, that kind of frames our vision for what these folks are like. Now, should we put off onto the government all of these responsibilities or to big institutions all these responsibilities to care for the poor, care for the needy, make sure justice is enacted, or is that also our individual responsibility? You know where I'm going with this, right? So in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet was talking to everybody that was a God follower in this particular country. This is a long time ago, but he's speaking on behalf of God to everybody, not just the leaders. And here's what he said. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Isaiah chapter 1. Is that your responsibility? Yes or no? Yeah, it is. It is. Because this is repeated, Old Testament and New Testament, that if you're a person that's following God, we can't just say, well, you church leaders do that, or you government leaders do that. No, 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 no. This is something that comes down to the individual level that all of us individually have to take responsibility for and say, you know what? If across the street from me is somebody that fits that description, 
I should care about them on behalf of God. I'm God's prince or princess or king or queen, you know, whatever you want to call us, who is representing God to then go and help care for that person. It's pretty awesome. That's an awesome responsibility. Jesus picked up on that and made it really personal. In Matthew 25, he said, in verses 35 to 40, he's, he's talking about the end of time and kind of, you know, who's going to be given eternal life with God and who's going to be separated from God because they, they just keep saying, I don't want you, God. I don't want you as my leader. I don't want you to tell me what to do. I just want to focus on myself and do my own thing. Jesus is very clear that we're going to kind of fall into one of those two categories. And for those that love God, he says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. <laughs> but then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? Well, the king of all the universe will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of the one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now that was a, a pretty powerful statement because for me, if Jesus showed up at my door, knock, 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 hey Nathan, I'm really hungry, I mean nothing would stop me from going to my refrigerator and finding whatever I could find for him, right? And it wouldn't be like the out-of-date, you know, <laughs> canned food that I, I was just going to throw away anyway. Hey, this is good enough for you, Jesus, right? No way. You know, if I knew this was Jesus, I would want to make sure that he was cared for. And Jesus is like, look, when somebody is the absolute least and they're truly in need, now this is different from somebody just manipulating the system, right? I mean, this is somebody that's representing Jesus to other people, which is just saying, I'm in complete need. I can't help myself. I truly can't. If I could, I would have done it by now. But I'm in totally, total need. That person who is in true, true need, how they get treated by the individuals is how those individuals are treating Jesus. And that's for you and for me, right? And, um, and we identify with that. When we've been in need and somebody has cared for us, we love and appreciate that, Right? I mean, we're like, we're thanking God behind the scenes. Even though it was a human that did it, we realize, well, God was somehow working through that person. And we can probably all identify that somebody helped us get a job or they gave us that break or they, they recommended us for this thing or they filled out this recommendation or they, they helped us when we didn't have enough. And we're like, man, God, thank you for working through the human. So it's an individual responsibility that Jesus himself really, really says this is really important. So we can't just make excuses and say either all the institutions ought to do it all for us or, ah, we're all sinners, so we're never going to get it right, so the heck with it, <laughs> you know? I'm just going to go back to eating my Cheetos and playing my video games, right? I can't, I can't do that because Jesus says, look, this is your responsibility individually as well as then when all the individuals get together, the organization should be like that. So let's get really, really practical and start thinking about an organization. What organizations are important to you? Just kind of think about that. You know, maybe the government, maybe the school, maybe the school system, maybe the, maybe the union you're a part of, maybe the company that you, you're relying on, right? I mean, this is a big deal. They hold, they hold a bit of your life in their hands, you know. What should we expect of them? My first question would be, well, it's going to depend on the answer to the question, how many people in that organization are really truly sold out to following Jesus with their whole heart as best they possibly can? If it's a high percentage, then your expectation for that organization goes up. Because, you know, wait a second, they're like, they're sacrificing for all the things that are important to God. So if a lot of the folks in there, not just how many people call themselves Christians, because that we've realized Jesus is really clear. Like, you can say whatever you want, but the proof is in what you do, <laughs> the acts of faith. So how many people in that organization truly, truly are like, God's first in my life. I want to love people like Jesus loved them, which means if he was willing to die for them, I would be willing to die for them. 
how many people are going to be like that in that organization? That's going to set your sights pretty high, expectations high, or pretty low, <laughs> right? Even when it comes to churches, churches have been called hospitals for sinners. Pretty accurately, right? We're kind of hospitals for sinners. In a hospital, how many people are getting well at any given time? Most of them you're hoping are getting well, but some of them are getting worse. And some of them are just kind of stagnant, right? And the doctors are scratching their heads going, we're not sure, right? So in a hospital, some people are getting better. Some people are just, you know, kind of rejecting what's going on there. Some of them are just kind of in the middle. And in a church then, you may expect us all to be perfectly loving Jesus, but if we start talking to all the individuals, we realize a lot of us are trying, and some of us are really nailing it, and some of us are really struggling, and you just kind of get everything. So that sets our expectations a little different. People and systems may be imperfect, broken, and messed up. So that's the second thing to look at. When you're trying to figure out, is it fair for me to be expecting this of that organization? Then we say, wait, look at the whole organization and how it operates. Is there something broken and sinful even about that organizational structure? And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, let's talk about Greece for a second, okay? Let's just kind of put it off, to our country off to the side, and let's talk about Greece. Greece financially doing great or not so great? Not so good, right? Part of the problem, you can retire at a very young age and there aren't enough young people working to help pay for all those folks that are retiring at a really young age. The system then gets to be a challenge. But when Greece went to all the like 56 and 57 and 58 year olds and were like, hey, we really need you to go back into workforce, <laughs> the folks were like, uh-uh, <laughs> that's not what you told us. We're supposed to be able to retire right now. That'd be like us going to all the 69-year-olds, you know, here in America saying, hey, you've all got to go back into the workforce, right? And be like, well, uh-uh, you know, well, but some of them might be willing to, right? And it gets into this really, really difficult situation. The system itself is such that they're going bankrupt. So what, what do they expect of that system? Well, the expectations are starting to go very low. Why? because the individuals themselves haven't been able to work out a, a workable solution. Because all of a sudden it gets really complicated, right? And we see that, we see that. And so when you're looking at an institution, it may be that the institution can't get better. I've been a part of some meetings where even if all the individuals in the meeting were gonna do the right thing, the system overall wasn't going to allow us to make the changes that need to be made. And I talked to a political science professor about that one time, and she said, that's why you have revolution sometimes. When you absolutely can't get the system to change, you have to start kind of a new system or something, you know? So like when America was started, they were trying to get the king of England to act Christian because it said in their constitution they were a Christian nation, and they couldn't get them to act Christian. Then revolution happened, right? The expectations for the organization started going down when they realized the organization itself is so sick and corrupt that the individuals can't change the right way. Okay, so is this making sense? So it, it might affect the, your attitude, it might affect how way you do things. So let's then go to what we can do about it. What can we do about it? What can we do for the institutions? What can we do about our government and our schools and so forth? And the first thing is, this may sound weird, but I would say let's be thankful and start with an attitude of gratitude rather than criticism. Let's be thankful for those things that are working right. Because all of a sudden, we're going to get more creative. We're going to have better ideas. We're going to find ourselves in the love of God rather than the criticism of Satan. Is Satan a really positive guy or a really negative guy? Very negative. Most negative you know, possible. Tries to drag things down. So if you find yourself... When you talk with other people or you post things on, th on Facebook and you're always negative, mm, check yourself, right? There is a prophetic negative word that sometimes has to be spoken, but if everything we're doing and saying is negative, then we may realize that we're not on the right side. <laughs> Does that make sense? I mean, is this kind of connecting? And so if we're starting to think about that, I started thinking about that myself because I can get very upset with organizations. I mean, I am generation X, right? We made cynicism like a lifestyle. That's why grunge music and some of the alternative music stuff, you know, I mean, you know, some of our heroes you know, took us really dark, really down, right? And, and, and so I can go there, but when I step back and I say, you know, wait a second, um, 
Let's talk about schools for a second. I'm really thankful for our public schools. I got a lot more thankful when I went to Haiti and, and saw a country that doesn't have public schools. They have private schools, but how many people can afford them? Not a lot. So you end up with this populace that's struggling. And then I look at our country and I'm like, hey, everybody wants to tear down public schools, but we got a good thing going, we just need to work on it. I mean, I'm thankful, I'm thankful. When my kids come home and they're learning things that I didn't have to teach them, that's a good deal for me. Amen? Like, does that make sense? You know, that's pretty sweet. Now, we've got problems, I get that. But if we start going toward the problems from a sense of thankfulness, all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, wait a second. Thanks. When you look at the Psalms, there are a lot of, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. Well, there's nothing to be thankful for. Well, yeah, there are. There are a lot of things to be thankful for. And I know a lot of public school teachers that are praying for their kids behind the scenes. They can't do it necessarily right there in the classroom real publicly, but behind the scenes they care and they're really investing. So let's start from an attitude of thankfulness. And then as we look at all this, you know, we think about the government. Is our government pretty good? Are they doing really pretty good things? Yeah, they are. That's why we have an illegal immigration problem. If we weren't a good place to be in, illegal immigrants wouldn't try to get here. Right? So on the one hand, we can be negative, 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 or we could say, hey, God, I'm thankful that this is a good place to come to. When my uncle came over as a refugee and then learned English and became a citizen and started businesses and is as patriotic as any veteran you're going to find, like he will get in your face if you tear down America. He's like, that's not why I risked my, country, my, uh, my livelihood to come here. It's not why I risked my life to come here. I came here because this is a good country. We start from an attitude of gratitude. Then as we start to, f- try to figure out the problems, it takes a different tone. And people start to want to talk to us. <laughs> hey, because we recognize these really good things. And think about the church. And overall, we have a wonderful system of churches in America. Are there problems? Yeah, there are. <laughs> are there problems here? Yeah, absolutely. But overall, are we blessed to have the churches we have? Yeah, man. Yeah, we are blessed. You don't like a style of music or you don't like a particular preacher style or something, man, you can find other places and you could walk there. I mean, this is a, an amazing country where if you really want to seek after God, you can find a place to do that. Starting life groups and stuff, you're not going to go to jail for that. In some countries, you would. Like, I would be... I'd ask you to, to basically be signing away your life by saying, hey, I want to start kind of a Bible study, life group, something like that. But, but here, we're free to do it. We get the opportunity to. So we start off with this, this thankfulness. So then we get to do our part, right? We get to do our part. Jesus was like, look, on an individualized basis, when these folks are in need, and they're truly in need, you, my follower, my Jesus follower, help them. Take on that responsibility individually. Then, as you're a part of an organization, you're helping that organization to be better and better and better because you're doing your part. When there's evil that might be done and there's good that might be done, you're choosing the good. When there's a word that could be spoken on behalf of God, you're speaking it. You're saying not, I could or they should or I might or they might. We're saying, I will. I will step up and I will do it. I will help. Or I will gather people together and I'll seek the Lord. Or I, you know, I mean, we've got, we've got folks stepping up saying, hey, I'll help with the band, you know. And we've got folks maybe in your company or your business um, who are starting to come forward and say, hey, I will help. I'll do that. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a sacrifice. But I'm going to take the responsibility and I'm going to do that. And so we get this whole movement of people saying, I will, I will. Say that with me. I will. I will. You know, one of the most famous places we do that is in marriage, right? You know, I will. I will be there. I will support you. And marriage is supposed to be a reflection of, of God's love for Christ and Christ's love for God the Father and Christ's love for the church and for the people that love him. And so here we are. We're living out a reflection of God's love. That's what you're doing. For whatever organization you're a part of, you are a reflection of God's love. So if you want to start a life group or if you want to help here or if you want to just simply say, you know what, there is something God's been putting on my heart for my company or my club or something like that, and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to, I'm going to be the one that makes a difference, I want to pray for you right now, okay? God, I pray for the person 
that right now is thinking, ah, whoa, this is a weird message because I've been thinking about doing this and, and I think maybe, God, you want me to do that? God, confirm it. Help them to know this is what you want them to do. Or if they take a step and it's not, then just shut that door and help them to find something else that you want them to do. God, we want to be we will people. We will do your will. We will help those that you want us to help. Strengthen each person that is here. Help them to walk out of here stronger and more on fire and less negative, more thankful, because you, God, are working all things for the good of those who love you. You've promised it, and we're going to help make that happen because we're doing what you want us to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.